Hello everyone. Today we will talk about eVPN, Ethernet VPNs. Of course, uh, although it came out for the layer two VPNs and tried to solve many probably not issue but uh, bottleneck of VPLS. But uh, today we are doing much more than just layer two VPN, and uh, we will discuss all all those integrated details and uh, we will talk about the route types as well and how they are applicable uh, for the real life design and deployments we will discuss uh, with me tony here and tony wrote a very very nice actually book on that i reviewed from the beginning and uh, i really like the book and uh, i offered we should definitely talk EVPN in more details because there are these route types are used and uh, there are many of them actually there are six seven etc but uh, mostly used uh, interesting one important ones are here and we will deep dive those and of course not only route type but also uh, we will discuss EVPN in general so Tony welcome nice to have you here yeah thanks for inviting me yeah uh, so uh, Tony a little bit before we start, uh, would you like to mention about your book also? So you wrote that, uh, were you using eVPN in your environment or, I mean, it's really very, very detailed book. So uh, how did you think why I should write, etc.? How did you decide? Well, uh, it started about the personal blog where I wrote we excellent related blog posts and then people start asking me why don't you write a book and then i consider that writing a book is a way too heavy project for my kind of semi-lazy network engineer but then i decide okay why not i have a goal to write a book and then i then i did it it is it was a very hard process since uh it includes a lot of studies. It was almost as hard as CCIE, preparing the CCIE certification. How long it but, took? Yeah. How long it took? So around a year, probably. Around a year, yeah. Precisely around a year. Yeah, so I remember uh, three of my books minimum took like seven months, the, the shortest one. So it takes really a lot of time and effort and uh, through the technical reviewing life the cycle etc it takes time but uh, even yeah. after that still uh, some people can find some typos etc those small mistakes but still uh, as long as the content is uh, relevant useful and i really found your, your book uh, useful now let's start let's talk about it can you please introduce agenda what we will talk so uh, meanwhile of course i will interrupt uh, ask some question so we will try to make this one as uh, one of those best video hopefully on evpn and route types okay okay uh, the session agenda is as orha mentions btp evpn route types <clears throat> and we are we are going to go through route types from one to uh, five but not within numerical order so we are going to start from the route type two and route types btp evpn right route types from my perspective are the heart and soul of btp evpn and vx and fabric since when you understand how those are constructed how they are used and how they are used especially in the control plane then it's much easier to understand how the machine called VX and Fabric actually works. So, because it is complicated, it, it in a way replaces a, a complexity of spanning tree, but as a trade-off, we get a, also a bit complex system. But okay, uh, the first route type that we are gonna go into true is route type 2 which is mac advertisement route i think that it's the most well-known route type speaking about btp evpn and it it is used for uh, layer 2 switching so we advertised locally connected mac addresses by using route type 2 and uh, when we 
advertise those MAC addresses, they, we can use it for a couple of purposes. We can use it on uh, route type 2 MAC advertisement route to inform or to establish connection within virtual network uh, between the virtual machines, for example. But we, by using layer 2 VM, we could also make VX on fabric as a layer 2 transit network. So, the, for example, let's say that the gateway is in firewall, which is connected to VTAP switch, and the hosts are using that firewall as a default gateway. So, in turn, the VX uh, and fabric is only transit network. Then there is a uh, other use case for route type two, uh, two. It is a layer three, a three connection. So, the, between the virtual network within the tenant or virtual routing or forwarding instance, uh, however you want it to call it. It is also the purpose of route type two. Then, of course, we are using it for reducing lay layer 2 broadcast and unknown unicast and multicast traffic. So those are the uh, use cases for route type 2. And we're going to go much more in detail yeah. when we go further. So, for example, when we say reducing uh, layer 2 BAM, BAM stands for broadcast, unknown, unicast, multicast, for many of you anyway yeah. know that. So reducing uh, BAM traffic Basically, it's advertising. We are advertising with the route type to make IP binding, so ARP uh, information between the devices. So we will uh, see in detail those route types anyway. So let's continue, please. Yeah, and then we are going to speak about ARP suppression in that case. Yeah. Okay. Then we have route type three, which is inclusive multicast route. Uh, need to rearrange my windows here in my laptop. Okay, it is used for ingress replication. So basically what it means that we can send a layer to bump traffic over IP only network without having a multicast enabled underlay network precisely. So we built, uh, built ingress tunnels between leaf switches basically that is that what it means but we we will go through also that in greater detail but we are we doing on. unicast forwarding basically ingress replication unicast yes it's not actually exactly. multicast yeah yes yeah okay then we have route type 5 which is quite simple prefix route it advertises the subnets and we can use it for advertising locally connected subnets or subnets from the uh, fabric external sub subnets, for example. Okay, when I come to here, route type 5, the question is this. I don't want to use yeah. EVPM for layer 2 at all. I want to use like classical 2547 L3 VPNs. So with the route type 5, can I do, can I use EVPN for the layer 3 VPN service? Oh, uh, let's see that on the route type 5 okay. when we go detail. Okay. Yeah. Okay, then there is uh, two route types, route type 4 and 1, which are the, well, from my perspective, the hardest to understand, but they are used for standard-based Ethernet segment multi-homing instead of, well, let's say Cisco have the VPC multi-homing. So this is standard based. And there are route type four, which is Ethernet segment route. And it is basically used for finding the other member of the Ethernet segment connected to the same Ethernet segment than what we are connected to. And then it is used to select the designated forwarder for layer two bump traffic and bus split horizon. Then we have a uh, type one, which is Ethernet AD route. It is using for load balancing, I, aliasing, I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm from Finland, so my pronunciation, by the way, I might will, sound a bit... I will say also nice. aliasing, but um, let's see the difference between load balancing and aliasing, what you are trying to say there. Yeah. It's important. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm going to cover that. 
Uh, and then there's the fast convergence mass withdrawn, where the type 1, actually type 4 is also used for that one. They are in a way combined and advertised within one BGT update when something happens in the Ethernet segment interface. One of the most important convergence feature there actually, uh, and separating the VPLS convergence from eVPN convergence. So why we are saying you can converge faster in eVPN, one of the uh, feature there, mass mac withdrawal. So RAW type one, cool. Yeah, and by the way, when you mentioned VPLS, uh, the latest implementation that I have done is almost 10 years ago, so I'm not so familiar with it anymore, even though I was speaking about it in Barcelona, Cisco Live 2010, if I remember correctly, but, but it, I haven't used it, so it's, I don't remember much of the details no about the computer wires and so, those kind of things. Okay, I tried to change, uh, change the next slide. Sure. Okay. Is the text still readable? Yes, it is. And we are talking, I think, about uh, route type 2. Yeah, now we are actually starting it. So this is the uh, control plane part of the local virtual tunnel endpoint, NAC advertisement road. So what happens when host joins the VXL fabric? This slide describes that event. So let's say that we have host B, which is connected into VLAN 10, which in turn is attached in the virtual network identifier 10,000. And it boots up, so it might send a GR layer 2 broadcast message to inform other devices in the network that, hey, I'm here, as well as it also verifies the uniqueness of its own IP address. That's basically how I understand how uh, GR is used for. But um, on the other side, there might be silent host as well, right? We are not talking about that case. I'm going to go through that when we are speaking about the prefix route. But when, if the host informs its existence, uh, the local uh, leaf switch learns the MAC address from the English frame. It installs the MAC address, source MAC address in the VLAN specific uh, MAC table. And from there, it is exported into layer two's routing information based specific on that virtual network, which is in our example case 10,000. Uh, in addition, from the GR message, the switch learns the IP address information of the host, so it installs it in the ARP table. And from the ARP table, it is exported also into layer two routing information based, but in a, uh, as an IP where of just, oh, just a second. Entry. That's that. Yeah. That's not the you know. That's the confusing part because we have layer two VNI and we have layer three VNI, right? Yeah. So exactly. yeah. So IP VRF. When we say IP VRF, it is layer three for us. Why you are talking about now layer two VNI and IP VRF there? A uh, very good question. Since from the art table also, what I'm going to show also, there is exported into layer 3 routing information based. Uh, but from the ARP table and IPVRF and table, the information is straight, uh, taken on the receiving side to the ARP suppression cache. It's on the next slide, how, how does it actually work? Or how I see that it work? So even uh, if I don't have any type 5 route, which is IP route, I still have yeah. here with the route type 2, I still have IP VRF, is it? Yes, you are uh, with uh, the uh, MAC and IP address binding information is sent uh, within the route type 2 MAC advertisement. So the router generates or the leaf switch generates two BTB updates. The other one includes, is the blue one, it includes only the MAC address. And in the receiving side, that MAC address is stored into MAC address table, but I'm going to show the details on the next slide. And 
as we can see uh, in the blue box, which is now the Mac only advertisement, there is only layer two virtual network identifier also and the route target. So the route target is formed from the ASF number, which is 65,000 in our case, colon VNI identifier. So those are auto generated with our example. You can manually configure them also, but that's another story. And the lower one, the yellow box, includes the MAC address, but it also includes the IP address of the host beef. And it also includes two additional uh, BTB extended communities. The other one is an additional route target, which describes the layer three, or actually which is used for layer three import policy in the receiving side. And in addition, there's a router MAC address extended community. And that is basically used when we are routing traffic between the uh, virtual network. So VXLAN is basically I, um, MAC in IP UDP encapsulation. So in the inner uh, Ethernet header, we need to have a MAC address, even though we route packets. So the inner uh, inner source MAC header MAC address will be taken from the router MAC advertised by the route type two, which includes uh, MAC and IP addresses. Mm -hmm. This is a bit complicated. It's also a bit complicated, by the way, to explain. <laughs> yeah, it hopefully is. you get the point. So uh, what I am getting here when we have that MAC I MAC address, okay, route type two, we are advertising. Uh -huh. MAC addresses between the devices, but uh, also we are advertising MAC and IP binding. By, by the way, this is mandatory, right? So mandatory. Yeah. So we are not only yes. MAC address, but also MAC IP binding information for the ARP we are advertising. So this, uh, and for this one, I have layer two VNI as well as I have layer three VNI for every advertisement. Oh. Yes and no, we are advertising these as the layer 2 VNIs and they are using only for layer 2 purpose. I'll go to next slide. Okay. I think that it might open it a little bit better. Okay, this is the receiving side. The uh, blue part is quite straightforward. We received a route type 2 BTB update and we installed it into our BTB table. So the uh, we installed it based on the route target, which was uh, 65,000 colon our VNI virtual network identifier 10,000. So in the this is now the receiving the remote switch actually. And from the BTP table, we installed installed the routing information, the MAC only information in the MAC VRF on the layer two routing information base. And then from there, from the layer two routing information base, we install the route into the MAC address table of VLAN 10. This is quite a straightforward, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but now we go to a bit confusing part, the MAC IP advertisement. So it, it is an separate update but can be sent within the same update that we send the mac only information so the mac ip address as we uh, spoke about includes also the ip address in addition the host mac address it is imported uh, from the btp table into layer 2 routing information based and from there if we enable arp suppression it is in installed in the ARP suppression cache. So there is an information of a host IP address, its MAC address, its the VLAN where it's connected to, and the next of address. Uh, by the way, a question, are you able to see the whole slide? At all. Since in my, yeah, good, good. Since I'm, I'm see, seeing my head speaking and I also see orphan video, so, but it, 
obviously you are only seeing the slides. Don't worry, okay. everything is fine. Yeah, all right. But also from the BTV table, we are exporting to Mac IP information in the layer three routing information base as a host route. So actually we are not going to install the MAC ad address there, what, but what we are going to install is the slash 32 host route. Okay. Which... So here, the match I, I think here yeah. it's, uh, this one is uh, probably clear anymore. So we that's why we were advertising in the beginning with the route type two, always two route targets, one for the layer two routing information base, another for the layer three routing information base. Yes, so uh, precisely the MAC I, uh, the update that includes MAC address and IP address information carries two route targets. The other one is for the layer two, which is used for ARP suppression, and the other one is layer three, which is used for routing between the virtual networks. So is layer two RIP equal to layer two VNI, and layer three RIP is equal to layer three VNI? Uh, yes. Okay. So because there, there's, the, actually, there's EVPN policy on layer two read which defines which road targets are imported into a BTB table called lock read, which lo is local, local read. read. Yeah, local. Yes. Exactly. So yeah. we, we have agency read in here, local read, agency read out, still all the concepts still same here. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. for the because uh, layer two rip or layer three layer two rip especially we don't talk about it normally and we say layer two VNI. I want to make sure we are talking the same yeah. one. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit confusing, but how I see why we have the structure called layer two routing information base is that if we think how BTB works, we can take routes to the BTB process from the BTB adjacency, speak, BTB speakers, or we can take routes in the BTB process from the routing information based. So we, in order to take layer two information, we also, into BTB, we also need layer two routing information based. Yeah. That's how I see. And uh, still the same uh, RT import export here we have, like uh, RT import importing from BGP into uh, layer 2 VNI and export from layer 2 VNI into the BGP. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, this was the control plane part of the route type 2. And now there's a couple of use cases. I, I rearrange my a little bit. Okay, now we in this example we have two hosts. Host B is connected on the leftmost we take 101 and the host ABBA is connected in the same VLAN but in the different WTIP switches. So in order these two ho hosts to speak between each other, there is a couple of things we need to do. First is it's a layer two connection or we are, we are using connectivity within the broadcast domain. So the host ABBA needs first the resolve to MAC address of host B. It knows its IP address, but it doesn't have any idea what is its MAC address. So it sends an R precursor, uh, which is layer two broadcast. And eventually it reaches its local switch 102. And now, since we received the both uh, MAC and IP address information via route type 2 advertisement, we have our ARP suppression cache information where we have uh, the MAC address of host beef. So the switch is able to answer to our precursors generated by host ABBA on behalf of host beef. So the switch 102 sends an ARP reply to host ABBA, which then constructs the frame uh, and send it to the switch, which in turn makes now the MAC address table look up. And the MAC address table for VLAN 10 
was created based on Mac only route type 2 advertisements. And then it's do the uh, VX and encapsulation. Basically, it adds an outer MAC address header, outer IP header, and the I, uh, outer IP header destination IP address is uh, the leaf switch that, uh, uh, in a way, owns the host uh, destination host, and the source IP address will be the sending switch IP address. And then there is a UDP. Uh, header and the VXLAN header. And the VXLAN header itself includes now the layer 2 VNI identifier, which specifies for which layer 2 broadcast domain this frame belongs to. And now from the receiving side, when the leaf switch 101 receives the VN, VXLAN encapsulated uh, Ethernet frame, it decapsulates the packets, it checks the layer 2 VNI from the VXLAN header and notice, okay, this belongs to VNI 10,000, which is attached to VLAN 10, and it sends uh, the message out of the port where the host beef is connected to. So this is the process how, how the data plane works. And also, switches when the oh okay when the host ABBA sends the frame, it also generates the control plane traffic. So this way, if it's the first frame that it sends to uh, its locally local virtual tunnel endpoint switch, the switch learns the MAC address and it generates the uh, MAC advertisement route type 2, and it sends it to remote leaf switches. Okay, which one is faster? I mean, uh, what if leaf 2 didn't learn first, but uh, from the data plane still can the leaf 1 learns, or is leaf 1 always learn first from the control plane advertisement, the MAC address of yes. ABBA? Yes. Uh, I mean, is there a risk condition here, or...? No, uh, actually, the, the control plane learning is the only way to learn remotely located host. We don't learn they, from the ingress uh, we, we have some encapsulated packets, we don't do MAC address learning. So we don't do so data plane don't, learning, then? We don't do data plane learning? No, no from, the, uh, from the remote we have some Encapsulated so pattern, lo pattern. locally, we, locally yeah. attached sites, data plane learning, of course. Yes, yes, precisely. Then we learn the frame, MAC address by and IP address information from the in ingress packets or frames. And mainly, okay. mainly from the uh, GARP messages, Grish, GARP, right? Well, yeah, it, it depends. It might be DHCP. Yeah, so, yeah or whatever, exactly. Whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So this is called intra VN switching. So this one is, uh, in fact, very, very clear. Uh, this is very clear. Only one thing, uh, maybe, probably yeah. we will discuss later on, but here the assumption was ABBA uh, sending ARP request and we have ARP suppression cache on leaf 2. What if ARP suppression was not enabled? If it's not enabled, then the ARP request message is forwarded to remote VHF switches, either as a multicast packet, if we have multicast enabled uh, underlay network, and we have specified in the uh, multicast group for this specific virtual network, or if we have IP only network, so we, ha we are not running multicast. So you, uni network. only unicast network, then ingress replication. Yeah, only yeah, then ingress replication. Okay. But then the broadcasts are spread all over. Yeah. Already some uh, people are angry that we are extending layer 2 anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know who is very angry for that. <laughs> <laughs> Many. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, then the... Okay, the slide didn't change. Another try. Okay, this is a layer 3. Basically, what I'm explaining in this slide is how 
the traffic is routed between the virtual network within one tenant or one VRF. So these two networks belong to the same virtual routing and forwarding instance. So uh, in this case, we are using the layer three routing information base naturally. So now when host ABBA start, uh, let's say it start pinging the uh, host cafe in an other subnet. So ABBA belongs to VLAN 10 uh, and cafe belongs to VLAN 20. So what ABBA does, it, it sends the IP packet to its default gateway, which is now uh, the switch 102. The 102 make routing notice that the packet is sent to VLAN 20. So it routes the packet and we have a specific uh, virtual network identifier for route all routed traffic. So no matter what VLAN or subnet within this VRF we are using, we are going to use one VNI for routed traffic. So it constructs an IP packet and now the VXLAN header includes VNI, virtual network identifier for, for routed traffic, um, which is defined under the VRF, which is common for all of these virtual uh, subnets within this VRF. Oh, that was complex. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we are we are not talking uh, IRB yet, right? No. No, this is a uh, this is a symmetric routing process. So, um, and it's called inter VN routing. So, this is not the um, there are also another case when we go to uh, route type five prefix routing, there is another routing mechanism which is more or less asymmetric, example of asymmetric, asymmetric routing. Yeah, but, but uh, is, I mean, we uh, have IRB, integrated routing and bridging. So we have two yeah. models with the IRB, symmetric IRB and asymmetric IRB. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but IRB mainly for VXLAN to VXLAN routing. At the moment, we are not doing VXLAN to VXLAN routing, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, now, when those VTEP 102 sends the packet, it uh, it uses for first its own system MAC address as a source MAC address in inner Ethernet frame, and then then it sends the packets to remote web switch 102 and sorry 101 naturally and when the that remote leaves switch receives the packet it de-encapsulates the packet and it notices that the vni carried in vxlan header is now the vni used for routing so it does the routing lookup for the destination address Destination address 192.168.20.12 and it notices that it belongs to VLAN 20, which is has routing uh, interface configured. And it's route packet from VLAN 77 to VLAN 20 and forwards the frame to the host beef. So this is how we used host routes advertised in route type 2. Okay, one question. Here the question is, VLAN 77 is mapped to VNI 10077. What about VLAN 10 and VLAN 20? Which VNIs they belong to? Well, VLAN 10 belongs to VNI 10,000 and we can let VLAN 20 is connected to 10,020. Actually, we are doing then symmetric IRB here. Symmetric IRB we are doing. Uh -huh. Right? Okay. Yeah, we are doing symmetric IRB. Why? We are using uh, uh, basically separate VNI than what we have locally. And then so like yeah. 10,010, then uh, return and forward traffic is on following the same path. 
and basically on the VLAN 10 side we are doing uh, first bridging to our gateway then routing from uh, VNI 10010 to VNI 10077 then uh, layer 2 bridging other side then routing again from uh, VNI 10077 to 10020 so symmetric IRB case we are talking at the moment yeah. yes did you say symmetric or asymmetric? This is symmetric. Symmetric, this one. Okay, yes, okay. Or I might pronounce, but I mean symmetric. Yes, yeah, symmetric. Be in a symmetric case, we will not use separate VNI for that. We will, yeah, at the moment we have three VNI. One local, 10,010, then uh, intermediate transit VNI, whatever you call it. Then uh, another yeah. side, third VNI. And the uh, return and forward traffic is following the same uh, same path. And there are pros yes. and cons of uh, symmetric and asymmetric IRB, but let's move on with the other route types, etc. when we cover. So uh, we will talk about the differences and some design options. I mean, yeah. Cisco, as far as I know, they, uh, they are following this model, symmetric IRB model. Uh, but of course, there is no winner, never in designs. Both has pros and cons. We will talk about those and let's move on. Okay, if I remember correctly, the next slide is route type 5. Let's see. Yes, it is. So this is prefix advertisement route, route type 5. So basically how these are generated, we can learn and redistribute uh, submit information from, from ITB, from the external network, or we can redistribute uh, static routes to BTB. But uh, the, I think that the most common use case is advertised the fabric external subnets into the fabric. So how the route type 5 is constructed, there is an only subnet information. There's no MAC information, no host, it's the subnet information. And there is only one route chart in carried within the BTB as a BTB extended community. And it, the route chart is now the AS number column layer two, three V and I identifier, yeah. which in our case is now 2077. It's the same V and I that we are using uh, inter V and routing. And <clears throat> why I have chosen this kind of weird V and I. These are chosen for the, uh, more of a year ago to my first blog post related to this subject. And 77 is, uh, let's say it's one of my lucky numbers. Okay. I don't know the reason where it comes from, but that's the magic behind the 77. Always there is a history. What, why people yeah. chosen uh, PQ space and yeah. uh, why the P and Q, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is the uh, prefix advertisement, and it's quite. Um, okay, I'll go to previous slides. Yeah, the, this okay. one is very clear. We have uh, the route type. Uh, I think it's automatically generated also, but you can uh, configure it if you want manually. Manual maybe yeah. can give you some uh, predictable assignment, etc. Uh, on the other side, maybe configuration complexity, uh, pros and cons, if, if you like, whichever. Yeah, yeah, that's so, all right. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Basically, if I want to use layer 3 VPN, like uh, just regular uh, 2547 type of VPN, this one is my route, right? Type, type 5. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm not going to go through the data plane operation of how we are going to send traffic to external network because it's just it's it's routing but yeah. what i'm gonna show here is uh, how we reach the silent posts by using prefix route type 5. i just need to rearrange my windows a little bit so in this case the how uh, silent host is host cafe the orange one on the left the left lower corner attached into VLAN 20 and now the VLAN 20 is connected to VNI 20,000 and then there is uh, 
a host unbox, which is connected into VLAN 10, which in turn is uh, attached into VLAN 10,000. And host APA is connected into VTIP switch 102. Uh, the same uh, switch also has VLAN 20. It's VLAN 20 and your routing in interface in the VLAN 20. So now when the host cafe doesn't generate any traffic unless it is asked to send something, so it's silent. So how does the host app can send traffic to it? So, okay, let's say we are using ICMP, we are doing pinging once again. So what host app does first, it sends the packets to its default gateway. And the default gateway now located is in rightmost wheelchip switch 102. Uh, the default of uh, the router knows that it will, this, this package needs to be routed into to VLAN 20, which is also has any gas gateway. And it routes the package the other VLAN that it has an, an active virtual gateway. One question, why we are using here separate device A, A, AGW then uh, leaf switch 101, leaf switch 102. Why we didn't uh, just use 101, 102? Do you need extra gateway there? No, they are they are they are both those SVIs are configured in one switch. But the, uh, those so, actually the A AGW is basically SVI on 102. So so for clarification, you draw that way, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Precisely. Okay, this, this is not a separate device, okay. No, 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 it's not separate de okay. device. It's, I, uh, it's an any gas gateway. Excellent. For, yeah. So it's here, we, the, by the way, for those maybe who don't know the, that uh, model, we have distributed any gas gateway. So uh, basically HSRP, as you know, HSRP, VRRP, those kind of things works based on active standby. So, uh, yeah. or any case, such as RPS, et cetera, limited number of routers and blah, blah, blah. So distributed any case. Any case means it's not a protocol, but a way of deploying IP address, same IP address on multiple leaf switches, basically, you, you assign. So proximity solved, uh, whichever device is the closest for me. Okay. Yeah. It has the same IP address and same MAC address. Uh -huh. So the, in the Anycast gateway. So now when we are do, doing local routing within switch 102, now when the packet goes to any gas, let's say it goes to the any gas gateway VLAN 20, it's, it's a virtual device within the physical switch. Then it generates an ARC request since it doesn't know where to send the packet. So now the leave switch generates our request to VLAN 20, which is then in VX and encapsulated and sent either multicast enabled or on unicast only enabled call to other leaf switches. And now in our case, we only have two, two leaf switches for simplicity, but eventually the uh, layer two bump Packet the ARP request receives to reach 101. So it forwards to ARP request out of the all interfaces that are attached to VLAN 20. So the ARP request, request finds its way to the host cafe and then it triggers the ARP reply in, the, in our silent host cafe. And it sends an ARP reply uh, to <clears throat> to uh, our VT101, which actually generates what a MAC advertisement route, of course, it's a route type two. So then all other VT switches get the information, that, okay, VT101 uh, is the switch where this silent host is connected to. Okay, couple things now. And, uh -huh. Yeah. 
very very clear very good so what we did basically uh, abba when it wants to send it first reach out to its uh, default gateway which was in vlan 10 but the remote host was in vlan 20 so on the switch 102 what we did routing first so we route the packet to vlan 20 then when we check vlan 20 didn't have arp in the arp cache the mac address of uh, cafe so it sends arp request how those are bomb traffic anyway arp is broadcast broadcast unknown unicast multicast we should put in a vxlan encapsulation now this vxlan encapsulation either via ingress replication which is unicast method will be sent to each and every actually switches within that vni which is 20,000 in that case and we are for simplicity we are showing two but it could be maybe tens of switches and all of them will receive either via ingress replication or if you enable underlay uh, multicast group so it will be pushed to everyone then when copy uh, receive this app request from vni 20000 it is replying back to default gateway which is uh, on switch 101 and 101 is bridging to uh, vni to another site 102 receive 102 will do the routing again uh, to reach the abba yeah precisely and 101 also generates the route type to MAC advertisement route when it learns the MAC address of host cafe. Huh, that, that's good. Good point. When cafe replies, ARP, ARP, when it sends ARP reply, is it sending route type two? Yeah. When yeah, 101 sends route type two. What the MAC advertisement since it yeah. it does local learning, it installs the the MAC address into MAC address table and uh, ARP table and it export them in the layer 2 rib where it is, it is advertised by using MAC advertisement route type 2 BGB update into other all other leaf switches. Let's say we have uh, hundreds of leaf, leaf switches in this example, then all switches now know or receive the the information where the host cafe is connected to because it is control plane bgp will advertise to everywhere so route type yeah. 2 uh, 101 will tell to the network uh, basically all the evpm peers that uh, this is the mac address of cafe and this is the mac and ip binding of uh, for the cafe that's the idea yeah actually yeah make an IP binding of cafe. That's important, not 101 SVI. That's, uh, we should we should tell that one as well, because uh, yeah. on the remote side, I am saying, okay, this is the IP address, this is the MAC address. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. And I, I'm pretty sure that that was all about route type five. I think it was really good. I think it was really good. We talked about the um, normal case, which uh, from maybe broadcast etc those packets we were learning from locally attached host uh, the MAC, MAC address and then advertise route type 2 if it's silent host how we are learning basically we also covered that so far we talked about route type 2 and 5 uh, it's so far good so but we have many many other things to talk still there yeah okay the next one uh, would you mind if I take a little bit of water since my class is empty? Of course. It, it only takes sure. 20, 10 seconds. Just wait a second. Sure, sure, sure. Meanwhile, let me have a look what we have. Layer 2 bomb. So broadcast, unknown unicast, multicast. And we will be talking now uh, about the route, route type 3. Uh, most For the most people, and even for me, the confusing part, uh, you know, four, one, and three, two and five, probably the most understandable because it's like a OSPF. So everyone knows OSPF because you are dealing with maybe daily basis. Uh, but uh, yeah, ISAS, you know, not much. So that's why uh, network engineering knowledge point of view, probably ISAS, a little bit less than uh, OSPF. Same idea here. Uh, you may not see in, in every network type 4 if you don't have multi attach segment uh, or yeah but uh, you don't escape from type 2 anyway something like that let's start type 3 uh, we should make this one very clear because uh, I don't see the clarity in any other video on the internet it, it, for me at least so let's let's speak about this okay uh, <clears throat> The use case for route type 3 
which is inclusive multicast throughout, is the setup to uh, English replication tunnels between the leaf switches specific to certain virtual networks in order to forward layer 2 broadcast unknown unicast and multicast traffic over unicast only underlay network. That's the main, that is, that is how we use our route type 3. Okay, but uh, I mean, yeah. when you say we are using this one for the tunnel, uh, VXLAN already doing this. Why EVPN is advertising another route type? What What is this extra tunnel? What What we are talking? That's my point. Uh, this is uh, okay. If we have a unicast only underlay network, and we don't use ingress replication. We, we don't have methods to forward layers through broadcast and unknown unicast traffic over the infrastructure in a decent way. So I try to answer the question by explaining the, this first, and then we can have an open discussion okay. about the, why we are using sure. this. Sure. So basically what route type three advertises <clears throat> uh, it the network layer reachability information that it carries uh, is the tunnel end of, well, actually, it's the switch ID used as a tunnel ID in the ingress replication tunnel. So in the tunnel where, where we are forwarding layer two BAM traffic, when we don't have multicast enabled underlay network. And the extended communities used in this one is of course the encapsulation type but also the route target which is, which is used for export and import policy so the route target is specific now to vm virtual network 10,000. so we only devices that hosts virtual machines and the virtual network 10,000 import this uh, information. So let's say that uh, if the widget 103 doesn't have VNI 10,000, it doesn't import this information and uh, well, which means that it doesn't also set up the English replication tunnel with 101 in speaking about the virtual network 10,000. Yeah, but still it might it might uh, build a tunnel for another VNI. Yeah, precisely, yes. Yeah. Okay, so I think this is clear as well, Tony. But then yeah. I will come to this conclusion that uh, if we are creating this, let's say, point to multi point tunnels, right? This is ingress mm -hmm. replication. So one, one guy is pushing the traffic unicast to each and every receiver let's say and yeah. then uh, let's say we are building the, those uh, tunnels and then uh, what's happening for that vni if i don't have this is the conclusion if i don't have multicast underlay transport for bump traffic uh, which only uh, basically i can do ingress replication for bump traffic anyway anymore which mean <laughs> if i don't have multicast transport I need to see always type 3 routes, which is inclusive multicast route, right? No, we don't. Why not? We, we could do uh, the ingress replication tunnel. We could define the tunnel also statically. So in each, uh, each le uh, leaf switch, we can statically define the tunnel pairs. But if it's not so scalable. If we have only, let's say, five switches, then it might be a good option since it's much simple because you don't have, have to understand the BTB route type tree and do the troubleshooting based on that. Okay. So you type on the on leaf switch 101 that ingress, I have a three ingress replication pairs, 102, 103, and 104, and statically define them without using BTB for that. Okay, what you are but, saying is basically, for that VNI, 10,000, let's say, I I can tell 
the replication peers I, I can specify manually and then yeah. and then conclusion is uh, okay if I can do this one static manually as well this is type 3 is for uh, this bomb traffic ingress replication membership so those guys dynamically learn that okay I will now be in this group replication group so if I receive this uh, type 3 route and accept this route with this route target so basically this I am in this uh, replication group it is used for that purpose yeah cool it's automated tunnel system and and I think that it's a, it's a, the by using BTB route type 3 from the automatization perspective is makes more sense than defining each pair statically each ingress replication it's pair more scalable way of course i mean if because there yes. will be so many group i mean so many vni and uh, even for devices so many vni for every vni if you would try to define all this stuff uh, it's much more uh, job to do of course uh, maintaining this will be a lot so what if yeah. fifth fifth device come come up? You will change the again yeah. each and every time. You will touch multiple devices to change the binding, which uh, basically devices in this VNI so ingress replication group etc. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, now it's clear as well, right, guys? So uh, we are going well. Yeah. Okay. Then there is slide about route type 3 data plane okay here this is basically how does it work and i i think that this is pretty obvious but i want to bring up one thing when we compared uh unicast only underlay network to multicast enabled underlay network so this is the case where we have unicast only underlay network and we are using these route types three to uh, establish ingress replication tunnels between the VTIP switches so the green pipes uh, the, are those tunnels actually so now when host beef is a sender for multi layer two bump, bump traffic it's let's say it generates an ARP request for for a host connected to the same network than it is the host cafe. So when the 101 receives the R request, it has to generate the uh, well. It sends separate R request to each ingress uh, tunnel pair. So it generates now in this case three packets and sends its to spine switch, which in turn forwards these back packets to each switch. But I think uh, there, there will be some, uh, there should be some optimization, like uh, generating once and then uh, just replicating it to the uh, peer. So it's like a BGP peer group. So we have some optimization here for the processing. Uh, otherwise, okay, for three maybe even generating update yeah. is fine. But if we are talking tens of devices, and for multiple VNIs, this ingress replication would be overkill. Okay. Yeah. By the way, there is typo, I think. Uh, host beef 10.12 and cafe also 10.12. There is a just typo. IP address, right? Yeah, IP address, yeah. Okay. The destination IP address. Des this is the maybe 13. Host. Destination ca cafe maybe 13 because otherwise they are same IP address. Oh, ah, sorry. This is the destination, ARP destination. Okay, fine. I, yeah. I just wrote, okay. Yeah. And why I why I draw these slides is because of this. So when we <clears throat> if we compared uh, the multicast enabled underlay network, how does it work? It, it works in a way that when now when the 101 receives the R request, it only sends the one message, the random multicast rendezvous point. Uh, configured in VNI 10,000. We are now speaking of the VNI 10,000 again. So, from the 101 perspective, there is two flows 
less than in case of in when we are using inverse replication tunnel. But from the spine perspective, the situation is precisely the same. It will send or repli replicate to our precursors out of each and every single interface which belongs to multicast outgoing interface list. So even though we have a multicast enabled underlying network, the traffic get generated for ARP is almost the same than what we are do dealing with the English replication tunnels. The difference lies from the sending switch. Uh, it, it doesn't need sense multiple flows. Okay. But it only sends one flow, but the spine switch will replicate. It's based on its a multicast outgoing interface list. Maybe another trade-off is this, couple trade-offs actually. One, okay, yeah. maybe here leaf is sending just one copy, then spine is replicating. So probably RP is spine, random point, you, you put it on the spine and then uh, it's still replicating to each and every leaf. Egress, yeah. egress leaf, let's say. But uh, the point is, you don't have here in the multicast underlay transport. You don't have type three EVPN route anymore. Anymore, you don't have yeah. type three. So uh, troubleshooting point of view at the leaf, it's uh, much easier. In, in uh, I would say. Well, it, it depends how know you know how no good you are troubleshooting multicast. Multicast, yeah. On the it, it, yeah. It might also be a bit weird if you don't know. That's how that, it that's works. that's right. And then not only that, uh, when you talk about RP, you are e probably doing that either ASM on or BIDER. So uh, in this case, you need to know where RP should be placed. RP engineering uh, we talk about, and then RP redundancy. Okay, is it any case RP with the PIM ASM, Phantom RP with PIM Binder, what we will do, etc. So it's more complex, uh, probably, yeah. Since the multicast is quite, it's not so used uh, protocol, I think. And I, 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 I wouldn't really agree with that, but I, I love multicast in the also self providers, uh, MLDP, etc. Yeah. there. I will I will talk with uh, another Tony uh, about about beer with index ex explicit replication and uh, he, he can mention yeah. also there. Uh, but I would agree, people probably in their data center for this purpose, if they are not running multicast just for this purpose, they wouldn't want to uh, introduce yeah. multicast there. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good well, discussion. Little by little, I uh, start to believe that the less protocols you are running in, in your network. The happier you are. Bro, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can get rid of one one protocol. Do it. That's bro, my bro, opinion bro. nowadays. I mean, extra getting the those type three routes. It's not the uh, tens of thousands of prefix, etc. It's just the one single prefix that you are the member of the ingress replication group. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Should we move on? We are not anymore within the time frame, but it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, this is uh, route type four. Now we go to standard based multi homing, which, in my perspective, is the hardest one to explain and understand. I'm not really sure if, if I understand it 100% yet, even though I, I have read the RFCs and try to understand it, but this is a bit complex, at least in my perspective. So, maybe I'm seeing. You mean type five, type uh, route type four, right? You mean route type four. Well, there is also route type one, but we are starting about route type four, which is even a segment route. And basically, how I understand how route type four is used, uh, first we have uh, wait a second, I think just rearrange my windows. Maybe I should first explain a little bit what is. What is Ethernet segment actually? Sure. What is used for? In the figure, there is a CE switch 104 connected by using a LACB port channel to two weighted switches, which are standalone switches. So they are not, they don't know the existence of each other in, in the starting phase. And the CE switch 104 doesn't know that these are actually the separate physical devices. 
So this is where the Ethernet segment drug and Ethernet segment is needed for. So we have our yellow Ethernet segment connect where there's those uh, 102 and 102 VTIP switches are co both connected to. So in order then to form a port channel that the CE104 can use, they need to know the existing of each other and they are using route type 4 for that purpose. So they send a network layer reachability information which carries the uh, ESI identifier which identifies the Ethernet segments that they are connected to and they are sharing to as well as it identifies the uh, router ED which is used uh, by the, the NVE interface which is basically the interface that does the VXLAN encapsulation when we send traffic to um, VXLAN core. So they exchange route type 4 messages and now how they import, import them, uh, export and import the updates. The extended community carries the ES import route target which is taken from the system MAC address and the system MAC address has to be same in each switch that are member of this specific Ethernet segment. So it has to be the same. It also, uh, the system MAC by the way, is the MAC address that's, that is advertised to LAC, LACP pair to 104. So they introduce themselves as the one switch by using the same system MAC address. And the, that system MAC address is part of the Ethernet segment identifier. Also, the Ethernet segment identifier, in addition, the system MAC address carries the local discriminator uh, information, which basically, if we configure the Ethernet segment in Cisco NXOS. It is the Ethernet segment ID and under that ID we define the system MAC address, but they together forms the actual Ethernet segment identifier. So uh, complex things, I try to put it in a bit a simple words. So we are using the route type for uh, to inform other switches that, hey, I am connected to this Ethernet uh, segment and this is my router ID. And the other use case, well, not use case, the other purpose of the route type 4, it is used for selecting the designated forwarder for layer 2 bump traffic for specific VLAN. So the route type 4 carries uh, the router ID within the NLRI path attribute. So I arrange my windows a little bit so... I by the way, by the way, when you talk to this too much already confusing, let me just interrupt and let's... Yeah. let's, <laughs> let's, let's Let's do this. Okay, let's yeah. do this. Now, for the, let's look at the 104. For the 104 to basically attach to two upstream, like uh, 102 and 103, in classical uh, term, we need to know that we are connected to the same device. But in fact, they are different devices. That's why in every uh, multi-chassis, etc. architecture, what uh, you are seeing there is a control plane channel between the upstream devices. They exchange the, some uh, some control plane messages like system ID. So that logical system ID is presented to the uh, downstream switch. So in this case, 102 and 103 needs to agree that system ID is this. And then uh, 104 needs to know that from both of these ports, okay, from both of my upstream uh, interfaces, I am learning the same system Mac, same system ID, so I am connected to the yeah. same device. That's why that guy can will be able to do LACP. That's why here system Mac, uh, seeing the system Mac is very natural, very obvious, of course. ESI, 
So I was uh, thinking about that Ethernet system identifier. You said that we are using, uh, we are generating ESI from the system Mac, and from the system Mac, now we are showing to the 104 that okay, it's now connected to same device. Normally, it's not not logically same device, physically separate device, yeah. and then uh, ESI. Ethernet system identifier. Now, since both 102 and 103 send to each other same system identifier, they know that they are both connected to the same segment. Precisely. What Precisely. about what about uh, let's say even in this let's say we need to send ESI in every uh, case. Like even if it's not uh, dual attached, dual attached. But let's say single connection, just a orphan port, some type of connection, let's say. 104 is not connected to 103, but just 102, let's say. Even in that case, 102 would generate ESI, right? Ethernet segment identifier, mm -hmm. and then 103 will receive, but I don't have this Ethernet segment identifier, so we are not connected to the same segment. Well, good be technical difficulty on the when we speak about a split horizon. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and speaking about a split horizon, the route type 4, as I mentioned before, is used for selecting designated forwarder for boom, layer 2 bound traffic for the specific VLANs. So there is a formula to calculate that one, and there are, this might be, by the way, a bit hard to explain actually actually let me no. tell you something i i when i seen this formula i thought this is actually very easy why people are making this one complex now let me tell you why, why. let me tell you why what it is doing eventually maybe i am wrong but uh, i tested it was working in, in my logic let me tell you how so here what you are doing vlan 10 okay vlan 10 you put in a modular 2 and then you come up with okay leaf but let's say 101 102 is the active device for that and then vlan 11 in modular 2 v 103 is active for that eventually yeah. what we end up i realized that we are doing odd even vlan separation so odd even vlan separation it comes down vlan 13579 is uh, active on the 102 and then 2468 will be active on 103 yeah. if you try that yeah. it's working or even vlan separation yeah. which otv works on uh, by default like that etc just they are explaining here in detail have you have you calculated if we have three switches uh, yeah you are right i i, I was thinking about <laughs> that for two it <laughs> but yeah. for the third one probably it will turn out odd even odd but, huh? but how this this is explained in certain materials even in my book might be a <laughs> yeah 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 definitely you. while talking but everything is easy but in the book yeah. i i get it this very fast so oh, since we are speaking about the route types and their purpose so the route type 4 carries the IPv address which is the uh, IPv address of uh, WTIP switches participating in the same ESI so that IP address is learned by all other switches sharing the same ESI so each switch learned learns and each IP address uh, IP address of each switch. So what they does next, they put the IP addresses in order starting from the smallest one. And the smallest IP address get ordinal zero. And the second one get ordinal one. And that is a, a bit crucial information, how I see it. Now when we have VLAN 10, so VLAN, the designated forwarder is calculated based on the VLAN 10 ID mod switch count, which is now two. So it's 10 mod two, and the result is zero. And the zero is a pointer of the original attached to switch. So in our case, the switch 102, which has the smallest IP address, has an ordinal zero so when 10 mod 2 is zero it points to switch 102 
<laughs> and when when we have we like 11, so 11 mod 2 result is 1. The 1 points to ordinal 1, which is given to 103. So this is the formula, how it is calculated. I'm pretty sure that people doesn't need this information in their daily best job, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, uh, still like behind the scenes, behind the scenes, how it works. Uh, my definitely audience want to understand. So here, the very thing, uh, algorithm is very obvious anyway. So if you are talking VLAN ten, you put the, the ten into modula and uh, two or three or four based on number of switch. Mm -hmm. Since we are talking to upstream module two, uh, and then yeah. ten mod two, if basic uh, math, you know, so it's uh, anyway zero and. Ordinal is selected based on the lowest router uh, IP address. So, but uh, for the two switches at least, my formula works, which means odd, <laughs> odd even VLAN separation. Um, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I will do the some math and I will uh, check if it is three switch, what happens uh, and VLAN number, how it is important for that, etc. And if I come with the odd even VLAN separation idea again, I will continue with that. Although this is very yeah. easy, easy as well. I mean, that's fine. For yeah. me now, yeah. for me now, that, that, that what's not uh, maybe hundred percent is uh, let's 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 walk through again. Type four uh, route I am sending in EVPN. Whenever, basically, if I am, is this all the time I am sending? Because uh, because. How I will know that I am uh, I am attached to segment which someone else also attach, so I may not know. That's why type four also should be there, right, all the time. Yeah. So. Okay, let's move on to, uh, to other. No, no, no. Other type slide. four, type four Ethernet segment uh, route. Uh, I am advertising for every update. Is it true? Because how I will guarantee that uh, there is uh, there is no one else, or maybe there is someone also attached to that same segment, multi-access segment. That's why I think it's uh, in every update I am sending it, this. This yeah. is this correct? Well, good question. Since I'm a bit a bit confused about the con a question, but. So this, yeah, let me repeat because uh, for my understanding, that's also in, in, important. Let's say here 102 and both 103 is connected to 104, right? So, yeah. and definitely we are seeing type 4 advertised by 102 and 103. So they tell each other we are connected to 104. Okay. Yeah. So far, so good. If, let's say, 104 is only connected to 102, not to 103. Will 102 yeah. still send the type 4 route or not? Yeah, it sends, but no one is receiving it. Or they receive, if, but they don't do any action. They do. They don't do any action if if it's the only switch connected to that ESI segment, Ethernet segment. It is the only switch that is using route chart, which is specified for that specific ESI. Which means so no one else is going to import, but uh, one or two will export and send the BTB updates about the Ethernet segment. But no one will install it, and it doesn't hear any other updates from any other switches. So it is the designated forwarder for all wheel and adapts to that port channel. Excellent. So which means type four routes, even that one or two is singly attached to one or four not multi-access, 104 is not connected to 103, still for every update actually I am sending type 4 route for, because it is saying Ethernet segment route here but uh, I see in some places uh, Ethernet multi-segment uh, multi or yeah, dually attached they are trying to say multi but it's not actually true this is uh, type 4 I am sending for every case because I cannot know my peer is connected as well or not yeah, that's true, and that's what we are trying to resolve. And by the we way, we try to find other members of this Ethernet segment. Yeah, and by the way, what's happening so far for we talked type two, type five, type three, and now type four. For all of them, we've seen uh, we are attaching for this route type route target value. 
So all of them has route target and remote device, whether it's installed into VRF or not, into the uh, into VRF table by having the same RT, RT value there. If not same RT, they will not install. So which means this guy also sends like type 4 route. I am advertising route target something. Here I don't see yeah. route target target by the way. Where is route target here? Hi, there. Yes. Uh, import, import route, route target. Yeah. So both of those devices has same route target because this route target we generated based on the ESI system Mac. So that's why. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if they have both uh, have those route target and ESI system Mac, etc. This all operation is uh, automatically can be done. By the way, it's done automatically, right? Yeah, it's an automatic process. You don't Automat have to do the configuration. Yes. And then if I uh, have this same system Mac, I will have same same route target. And if I have route target, I will install type four. If I have type four and, and my peer is telling he has also the same system Mac and that route target comes from him, we are attached to same segment. Now, if we are attached to same segment, I think this one, we didn't talk about the split horizon label here, but I think there is split horizon label here for loop prevention for that multi-access segment, right? by seeing yeah. this type 4. Let's talk about that one as well. Okay, I'll go to next slide. Uh, this is the route type for uh, split horizon. So <clears throat> here we have the same topology, but we have uh, two orphan hosts, host B and ABBA connected here. So in a simple way, express how does this work so when we have lacp port channel uh, the ce uh, switch 104 might select or uh, the interface that leads the non-designated forwarder switch so the when it sends the bump traffic layer 2 bump traffic so the traffic there's no guarantee that the traffic is sent to designated forwarder to this Ethernet segment. And when we send the layer 2 BAM traffic to non-designated forwarder for VLAN 10, the split horizon rules, and now I might need a little bit of your help here. So the, how the split horizon rules goes, the non-designated forwarder can forward traffic to the orphan host beef now here. It also forwards the traffic to the spine switch, which in turn forwards traffic to the 101, but it also forwards to 103, which now is the designated forwarder for VLAN 10. Now, when the designated forwarder 103 receives the traffic from its uh, ESI per device, it doesn't forward the traffic, it blocks the traffic from, so it doesn't send it the, or the back to the 104, but it will send it to orphan host ABBA. So this is how I understand the split horizon rule, and I, I need a little bit of help from you. Of course, uh, this is very important, detail. but here what we are not seeing is uh, split horizon label, because with the type 4, uh, type 4 route, we are receiving split horizon label. Basically, it's the uh, same like uh, automatic way of doing uh, site of origin, what I see. Like, uh, okay, if I receive now any packet from uh, 104, come to 102, it will, of course, reach to another PE, I mean, 103, uh, somehow, either through core or maybe direct connection you have. When, when it sees now split horizon label, same split horizon label, because type 4, they got from each other and the same label they have, if I see with the same label, split horizon label, I will not uh, forward that traffic towards that Ethernet segment. So split horizon yeah. basically works based on that. And DF, here actually, uh, DF, DF election, designated forward election, logic also was nice. Do you have slide for that? 
for the DF election. Uh, so they are first forwarding the traffic and, and then when they receive, they stop each other. So they, uh, one guy tells, okay, I seen your I, I, I think, uh, IP address. So I will be yeah. the designated forwarder. Then another guy will stop sending, okay, you, you are the master, etc. So, but uh, yeah. if we have slide, we can talk. Otherwise, uh, guys can check DF election uh, in uh, AVPN. I mean, the idea is obvious. I don't want to send bomb traffic to the uh, multi-access segment from two of those devices, extra resource consumption anyway. Uh, so one guy will be chosen as active. Uh, another guy will be stamped by anyway, non-DF. So, but you can have a look at that one later on. Okay. I, I think that the, the complexity of standard-based multi-homing is the reason why cloud providers use single home hosts, basically. Also, there is no standard uh, way of doing that anyway. So mm, all yeah, of them proprietary true. mechanism, those MC lag mechanism, there is no interoperability between any vendors. Yeah. Okay. Um, then there is the last route type, which is, uh, it's funny to say last route types one, <laughs> since it's the first route type. But either way, this is the Ethernet AD uh, advertisement. So uh, let me rearrange my window a little bit. So when we, when we have that Ethernet segment, we also want to inform the other remote widget switches that we, we have dual homed or multi homed Ethernet segment connected to, and you can do load balancing between 102 and 103. So both of these switches will generate surround type one uh, updates where they describe the Ethernet <clears throat> segment identifier they, that they are sharing and they are connected to. Uh, in addition, there is an uh, extended community pad attribute, uh, SEMPLS label, which describes that basically uh, that uh, we are using all active redundancy mode, meaning that both the both switches can be used for sending traffic to that specific of uh, the host that are behind that Eden segment. So basically, this is for load balancing. And this is also a bit complex, so we can have a, a discussion about this. But before that, I will take on the next slide. So what this informs to 101, this only informs that we, we are connected to specific Ethernet segment. But there might be case that now when host are up by sending some traffic to 104, it send it, it uh, uh, channel algorithm select to cha a port to 102, and only 102 send MAC advertisement about host up. So how can we do the load balancing since the MAC only update doesn't include the ESI information, they are all put on in zero. MAC IP includes the ESI identifier also, but MAC only doesn't. So <clears throat> what we need uh, in order to do the load balancing is to Ethernet AD uh, EVPN identifier ES update. So the, the route type is still one. So now what we are advertising, we are advertising that the ESI identifier, this, belongs to, uh, oh, well, it has route distinguisher, this. So the, for those who are not so familiar with this concept, the route distinguisher is in a way VPN identifier for for spine switch, but also 
it informs the remote switch 101. It tells what is the V and VLAN used uh, with uh, ESI, which is specified. It's the num long numerical value there. So how does it calculate? How based on the route distance user, how 101 knows the VLAN which this message belongs to or specifies to? There is a, a base value used in route distance user, which is 32767. And now when we do the math from from the uh, advertised route distance value 32777, when we took out 32767, we get 10. And that 10 is the VLAN ID. And it tells the VLAN ID connection to ESI to the remote switch. So I know or, or from that you are the teacher and you might put this a bit a simple way. So here, by the way, we are advertising this uh, Ethernet uh, type 1, let's say, type 1 route for load yeah. balancing from the core network. So now 101 can do, when it wants to send the traffic towards that uh, Ethernet segment, it can send both to 102 and 103, right? But yeah. but uh, that's the, there is a now questions coming. Let's say one one flow actually we say flow based load balancing. We need to understand this. All active is flow based load balancing, which means one flow is one link, another flow is another link. Okay. Yeah. So and uh, if we ad identify flow with the five tuple like source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port, and protocol number. What happens here, <clears throat> even we can, say, we can see now, same MAC address on two ports, right? So MAC address on two ports we will see. Uh, so if 104, right, sends, let's say ABBA, sends the traffic to destination behind 101. ABBA is sending traffic destination behind 101. And let's say it's separate flows. One flow is mapped to Ethernet 1 slash 1 on 104. Another flow is mapped to Ethernet 1 slash 2. Now, uh, there is no problem with it because anyway, 104, when it sees the MAC address of ABBA, it will say, okay, uh, basically I see from the locally attached this port and then now Traffic will be forwarded for some flows on this way and return traffic. This is the critical part. It, let's say one flow is mapped to Ethernet 101. It goes to switch 102 and then uh, switch 101. Return traffic is coming through the 103, let's say. Switch 103. And then it will come from, so it will come from an uh, Ethernet interface 1 slash 2. So which means Upstream traffic can go from uh, Ethernet 1 slash 1, but uh, incoming traffic can arrive uh, 1 slash 2. Is the problem? Is there a problem there? Do you see any problem? Like a uh, forwarding loop, etc. No, it's one logical channel. Yeah, and traffic, uh, the traffic will be uh, asymmetric here. It can be. Yeah. But uh, there is no problem with the asymmetry, right? No. If we consider internet, it's very asymmetric. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But and we are assuming also there is no any data plane like firewall, etc., device, etc., in the pad. So, uh, of course. And there is no problem with this asymmetry from the layer 2 loop point of view I'm talking about. Yeah. No problem. Fine. So, by but for me, it's not still 100% uh, other than the reasons, okay, layer uh, type 1 route is for load balancing, aliasing, etc. Type 4 is for multi-segment uh, and for split horizon and DF election, fine. But still, it's like type 1 and type 4 very similar and without uh, probably type 1 I can work. So can you talk about that? So without type 1 it works. I mean, if I don't want, let's say, active-active uh, load balancing, flow-based load balancing, do I still need type 1 route or not? 
Yes, I take the previous slide. So, in this slide, or uh, only 102 advertised the MAC advertisements. So, the 101 only knows the uh, host of the MAC address. We are 102. And by the way, for that one, we don't need any way uh, type one route. The, the MAC address advertisement no. is, is through type two. No. It's type two, right? Yeah, it's type two, yeah. like advertisement, okay. but there's no chance to do the load balancing in this way. Yeah, so but, and I don't want so to do load balancing, so do I need type one then? Or if you are using ESI multi-homing, it's automatically generated. I don't want to use multi-homing. I mean, I am attached to two, two upstream, like I am 104. Yeah. I am attached to 102 and 103. But I will use active standby, not multi-homing. Although I am multi-home physically, I don't want to use as active-active. I want to use active standby. Well, well uh, I'm not so familiar uh, in real life with uh, active standby since Cisco use active-active mode in NXOS switches. And I think that it's the only way those switches work. Okay. So I, I haven't test. Uh, other than active active mode actually in real life okay so probably yeah. not but because uh, I, I see the reasons so far also type uh, for the type one I'm saying uh, that aliasing load balancing by the way what is the difference between load balancing and aliasing okay uh, I, uh, I'll have one slide about that let's see if I'm able to explain this is it's my bedtime, <laughs> actually. But okay, here's aliasing. So this is the case uh, where only one leaf switch sends uh, or informs the host MAC address about the specific host. So here in this uh, output taking one, taking from uh, 101, the host upper MAC address is only learned as the MAC advertisement routes, route type 2 here, of via 103. But then there is an information which specifies to, oh, oh sorry, the slides change. Need to go to previous slides. So uh, there's a uh, route type 1 which specifies the Ethernet segment and the which switches attached to, to that specific segment. And now the host 101 knows that ho host ABBA belongs to that Ethernet segment, so it can do load balancing based on that. But I have, how I understand aliasing. But I have type 2 route, and type 2 route only comes from 103, uh, because 192, 168, 100, and 103 says in the show VGP, L2 VPN, VPN output. And then I have yeah. also uh, type one that, by the way, type types we understand from uh, there is a, a section there in uh, parentheses is one and two that route type. So so we have route type yeah. one from two next stop, which is one o two and one o three there. Uh, yeah. Why I didn't choose route type two and then just send word one o three? So is there a, a preference? in route type, so is route type 1 is preferred to route type 2, etc.? Uh, good question. Very good question, which I'm not able to answer, sorry. <laughs> no problem. I haven't thought about that. Okay. Uh, but uh, but what I also see that this is use, used for fast convergence in a way that if um, let's say that now we are using 103 for host ABBA, if if we lose 103, we can start using 102. Oh yeah, I mean uh, from the core point of view now, I uh, like core device 101 can send the traffic to, towards both upstream 102 and 103. By the way, we didn't yeah. talk about the Mac. Ah, now I was asking this Mac mess withdrawal. Uh, let's talk about this one as well. This is important for the phase yeah. convergence, data plane convergence, basically. And for those of 
people who are listening, if you are getting tired, this is the last slide. Yeah. We are, we have, I've spoken two hours. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, all, we are almost uh, at the end. Yeah, we are almost in the goal. So <clears throat> the mass withdrawn and fast convergence, in, in this example, 102 loses its interface, which is connected to Ethernet segment. So what it does, it sends a BTP update to withdraw all information related to this Ethernet segment. So it sent an Ethernet segment route uh, update where it uh, withdrawn the Ethernet segment. So it informed that I'm not participating in this Ethernet segment. Don't send traffic which belongs to this Ethernet segment to me anymore. This is one update that it sends. Then there is an Ethernet AD route where it dis uh, describes, wait a second, what I have wrote here, ES and e EVI ES. Oh, it, basically what it does, it informs that all hosts that are, are belongs to layer 2 VNI, it's one identifier is this route distinguisher, should be flushed out from uh, should not be sent to me anymore. So it withdraw every previously advertised information. And what it also does, uh, it informs to other members of the Ethernet segment. So it, for example, from the 102 uh, sends the message and it imported also 103. So 103 now knows that 102 is not anymore participating in the Ethernet segment. So it automatically defines itself as a designated forwarder for all VLANs, even those, even those uh, even VLANs 10, 12, etc. Yeah, because in the first we talked about that formula. So we were saying for some VLANs. 102 would be designated forwarder, some other VLANs, 103 would be designated forwarder. So when the 101 sends the bomb traffic, uh, both of them are not sending, but just one of them, whichever the designated forwarder for that VLAN, uh, it would send. Now when the uplink, of course, fails, 102 says that, okay, I cannot be uh, used anymore to forward the traffic towards that segment. So that's why uh, all VLAN, not only uh, the previous one, but all, for the, all VLANs for that uh, segment towards uh, towards 104, 103 will be active designated forwarder anymore. Okay, this is cool. Yeah. So make um, mess withdrawn then. Works. For the make mess withdrawn, uh, we are using we are sending for both type four and type one. Yeah, uh, type four is used for pairing with the devices and. Type one is for for those remote switches. So, so 103 use Ethernet segment route to know that okay, 102 is not anymore participating to ESI segment. And AD routes are how I see it are advertised to or used by 101 to understand that okay, the 102 two is not any more capable of forwarding traffic towards to ESI. Okay, for the remote so, guys, like 101, uh, yeah. it's using type one, but the same segment guys, like 102, 103, they learn those, those failures from type four route, okay. Yeah, and if you speak, I haven't drawn a slide about when the core link goes down for, for let's say 102, but in that situation, when it loses connectivity to spine switch, what it does, it just shut down all the ESI interfaces. There's no way to signal signal anything by using BTB when we don't have connection to spine anymore. So it just shut down the interfaces. Okay, uh, so what you are saying from 102 to spine switch, that link fails. Uh, it will shut down the interfaces, so the remaining guys, uh, after the conversions, it will basically select is himself as DF for all the VLANs, etc. And the remote guys will not send the traffic over 102. 
uh, it's yeah. not communicating 102 when the, when it loses the connectivity with the spine it's not communicating with 103 through the 104 through the uh, customer device so there's no, no no pairing through the logical layer 2 port yeah actually it is uh, just a layer 2 link there is no bgp connectivity over that so that's why fine so yeah. far so good anything else that you want to add no, not at this time. We can have an other video session if you want to, but I think that it's it's almost midnight here in Finland. Excellent. It, it, it was really a great discussion. So let's uh, probably set up another call as well because this, your slides are really, really very, very well, uh, very explanatory. I think uh, in the book also we've seen this stuff. So people should should get this book if they want to understand in even more detail spending time in your self-study uh, let's yep. talk about the second session definitely uh, tony by the way how people can reach out to you well i have a blog okay you are right and i'm also in linkedin you can find me there the link linkedin might be the best channel to use i think okay tony pasenen uh, they can reach out to you on linkedin same for yes. me they can reach out to me or an argument on linkedin i accept uh, all the requests no problem same thing for tony and uh, yeah. this video also will be in the, uh, public so please if you like the video uh, push the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel we will come up with the uh, more videos bye for now okay. bye thank you